I'm here because I'm interested in understanding that model that the Bushmen are using because it's effortless, it's fun, it's lighthearted, and incredibly powerful. And the results are lots of kids who love nature. Do you think our planet could use more kids who love nature? What we're talking about is ergonomic and not ideological, not philosophical, not spiritual, not religious, but almost bio-neurological, neuromuscular in nature. It is so below language and below thought that it is similar to eating or drinking. It's on that level with us, okay? Well, I've been doing this for 30 years and taking a lot of people and dropping them into these little terrariums of activity. And uh, some people I've been working with 16, 18 years, you know? The only place you find people working with people for 16, 18 years is in the martial arts or in religion. You notice that? In school, you're not allowed to. You know, they graduate, you don't see them again, right? You have them for one year. If you're a Waldorf, Waldorf teacher, you get to see them for eight years. If you start with them in that first year, they go for eight years together. But the Waldorf school is not an educational model from the Western world. You know, it's something that was brought in by a, a visionary individual who felt that building that kind of mentoring relationship between an adult and children was probably wise. In my experience in studying indigenous cultures worldwide who have this phenomenal power to connect people to nature, they only mentor. They do not have classrooms. They do not have teachers. They do not have experts. They have mentoring. And every child has as many mentors as there are significant relationships in their life. Okay, and the mentoring relationship lasts from birth until that elder passes on. They might start out as your older brother or your cousin or your uncle or your aunt, but by the time you're 50 or 60, they're passing on, but they've been mentoring you the entire way. The relationship follows you as a lifelong journey. That's all but non-existent in the Western world. Do you realize that? It's actually the opposite. In Western modern culture, there's almost no mentoring stories. And when you find them, it's this great coach who worked with you for two, year, two years in soccer. What an impact that person had on me. Well, I stand here telling you that I've been mentored by Tom Brown since I was 10 and I'm 50. So I have a 40-year mentoring relationship with this individual. And, you know, I still go to see him. And when I see him, he still pulls me past my edges. Why? Because he's 10 years ahead of me. And he'll always be 10 years ahead of me. And he doesn't... There's nobody in the world who probably knows me as well as he knows me. See what I mean? So he can take me places no one else can take me. Does that have value? You know, Why did we throw out the baby with the bathwater? At what point did mentoring not make sense to our culture? Try and figure it out. And you know where you're going to find yourself? Standing with the Roman soldiers. That's when mentoring was eliminated in our culture consciously. Nobody noticed because they kept at it long enough that everyone forgot that it existed. And then we passed it on as if it made sense not to have it. So we've had such a long period without mentoring that we don't even know it's not here in the Western world. And it may be one of the reasons why we're so destructive to ourselves, to each other, to the environment. That might be one of the reasons. What if human beings were born to be connected? What if that's what we're designed for? And I think about this one story, which is everywhere I go, I meet school teachers, and I do a lot of consulting in schools, and I talk to a lot of teachers, and they all know a 12-year-old girl who's really into horses. Right? <laughs> they, all know, they all know one. So I say, and so whenever I go to a new classroom with new teachers, they'll say, well, what about that 12-year-old girl who knows all about horses? And they'll be like, yeah. And they'll just start talking as if I know who they're talking about, right? And they'll just tell me all these stories about her. And yes, you know, you know, we'll start talking about anatomy, and I can't stop her. She'll raise her hand, and she'll just start telling me all the different parts of the muscle groups and the skeleton, and she'll just go on and on about gates. And, blah, blah, blah. and then we're in math, the same thing in math. You can't, you know, they just, they go on. I'm like, well, tell me, does she ever stop talking about the things that she's connected to? No, she just won't stop talking about them. Like, does she know anything? Oh, God. She, she, she's unbelievable, you know, like I hear this over and over again everywhere I go. Who knows that girl, by the way? Okay, all right, so 
Let me ask you something about that girl. Did she take a course on horses? No. Did she study a book on horses? Probably. She probably looked at lots of pictures and read things, but mostly probably told herself stories and invented things in her head while she was looking at the pictures. And you know, What she has is a connection to horses. Agreed? And with that connection with the horses, she developed this amazing understanding which has layer upon layer of complex you know, interdimensional understanding. Do you know what I mean? Because it's not just about time and space. It's also about emotion and feeling and wind and smell. And you know, you get what I'm saying? A lot of dimensions to that girl's connection to the horse. And in that dimension, in multiple dimensionality of that connection with the horses, all this information is stored there in this really efficient way. And it's all part of a story that has an ecology to it that she can access and pull in a million directions and she can apply, apply it to anything she's directly interested in. You see what I'm saying? That's connection to a horse. Right? A horse. Imagine connection to a kudu, an eland, a giraffe. Right? Get what I'm saying? The Bushmen have that kind of connection with all of the beings in the Kalahari that they interact with on a regular basis. They have that kind of understanding and richness to the tapestry of their relationship with all the things they're connected to. And what are they connected to? Well, if you ask them, there's, something, there's nothing that they aren't connected to in their home. You know, they're connected to all of it. So I am fascinated by this phenomenon. They're this tall, okay? They've got a stick with a kind of a ball on the end of it from a root. You know, they, they dig it up from the, under the ground and they cut the root off and they end up with this little kind of a handle like a cane. That's their weapon. <laughs> it's very, very impressive weapon, right? When I went through the airport in Johannesburg, several Bushmen came up to me who were now working in the airport. And they would take that stick from me and they'd start talking to each other and they'd ask me, where did you get this? You know, and they're hitting their hand with it and they're like, oh. You know? That's their weapon. Okay, so I want you to think now about a 400 pound plus lioness running at you full speed. And think about that stick. I don't care how big that stick is and how big that knob is. It's not going to do it against a 400 pound lion when you're this tall. Right? Why don't they fear lions? And why... Don't lions eat Bushmen? Leopards. They don't eat Bushmen. How many species of poisonous snake? I learned eight while I was there, three of which I was warned against. One room I had to stay in, they had door sweeps on them. And the doors were really hard to open and close. And they explained, don't worry about the way the doors open and close. You'd rather have that than a black mamba in your room. Right? Because when a black mamba makes up its mind, if it's nine feet long, it can rise four and a half feet. If it's 12 feet long, it can rise six feet. And it will strike you to kill you once it decides. And it can outrun you on open ground. So I'm like, I don't want to meet a mamba. <laughs> and they're like, that's why we have the door sweeps. <laughs> right? Do you know the Bushmen sleep on the open ground? They sleep on the bare ground. No sleeping bags, no barbed wire, no walls, no fences, no guns, knives, little knives that they use for carving stuff that they get from us when we visit them. You know, little pocket knives. They like those things. They're practical. They have bows and arrows, and they shoot these arrows with poison tips, and the poison takes three, four, five hours to activate to kill the animal that they're following, so they have to shoot it and then follow it for a really long time before they get the animal. How's that going to defend you against a charging lion? And National Geographic just published this really interesting study that said genetically they're 90% the same as the collective ancestors of all humans on the planet. They share 90% of the DNA with our collective ancestor. They've traced the DNA from people all over the planet and they've all come from one human stock and the Bushmen have 90% of that DNA. They are biologically very similar to our collective ancestor. So they are ergonomically some reflection of who we 
could be in relationship to nature, especially with regard to connection. 